characters, which is cool. Um, so uh, before we get started on stuff today, I just want to um, talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm going to go to the syllabus. So you know, click here. Uh, I've already opened it up another tab because um, <clears throat> I want to pull up the uh, um, schedule here. Uh, so uh, because of the snow days we had at the beginning of the semester uh, and um, two or three Mondays were affected by that, um, the school had to rearrange the semester schedule so that those Monday classes could uh, catch up. And what they did was um, <coughs> made tomorrow, the 7th, a Wednesday schedule. And so uh, <coughs> we have class, obviously, now. You're here. Um, but then tomorrow is like another Wednesday. So we're going to have class again tomorrow. Um, <coughs> so that's what, and I just, uh, you know, lay out the course and says week, et cetera, et cetera. So it says week 12, uh, 5, 6 to 5, 12. But then under week 13, it says 5, 7, um, <clears throat> which is tomorrow's date. Uh, it's OK that there's two weeks here, because week 13 isn't really a, you know, the same kind of week uh, <clears throat> material as we usually have. There's not any assignments associated with that. Um, it's just going to extend what we cover today. And then next week, um, we have the lab practical during the final exam period. Um, my Monday class and you are going to be taking that both at the same time because uh, that lab, I mean, that final exam period is for Monday, Wednesday, or Friday classes that meet at 135 or later, or, well, 135 to to something. Um, and so both of the, the classes fall into that group. They uh, Between the two classes, there's more than 24 students, and there's only 24 seats in this room. So I have to stagger the start times for that. Um, so you'll actually come in at 2.30 next week um, to start the practical. It's, it should only take about an hour for people. Um, and so my other group is starting at 135. So most of them should be done by 230, and there will be plenty of seats. Everybody can come in and have a seat. Um, and then you will probably be done with that by you know 330 ish. The final exam period technically is 135 to 325, um, which is an hour and 50 minutes. But because of the staggered start time, um, <coughs> you'll have an hour and 50 minutes available. So uh, if you need it, you can stay up till 420 to complete um, the practical next week. Uh, most people don't need to do that. Um, I can't think of any semesters where I've stayed much past the actual end time uh, for these practicals. Most people wrap them up in about an hour. Uh, but if you need it, you'll have an hour and 50 minutes available to you. Um, that's not going to be a problem for anybody. Uh, the way the um, final exam schedule is set up is uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes have final exam uh, periods on either Monday or Wednesday of the final exam week. And it just alternates back and forth. So like 8 o'clock classes are on Monday, 9.05 classes are on Wednesday, 10.10 10 classes are on, It just goes back and forth like that. So the 135 classes are on Wednesday. And then, um, see, what would the next time slot be? Uh, 135, 245, I think, classes, if such a thing exists, uh, would be on Monday. And then the next time slot, which would be 345-ish, somewhere in there, would be on uh, Wednesday after ours. You, of course, obviously don't have any classes at 3.45 on Wednesday because you're still in this class. So going a little bit long is going to be fine for you because uh, I know that you don't have another um, <coughs> final exam period on that day. And also, you're already accustomed to being here um, until, well, 
450 is our usual end time. So uh, being here until 420, if you need that much time, will be fine for you, uh, and it won't interfere with anything. Uh, so that's the way it's going to work. I just have to stagger because there's uh, too many students to fit in this room all at once between the two classes. So uh, you'll actually start at 2.30. Um, in the course schedule that you're looking at right here, if you looked at this previously in the last line there, it said all Blackboard board work must be completed by 5.13, uh, May 13th, by 1.35 p.m. I changed it. Now it says by 2.30 p.m. Um, I had said this previously. I just put it um, in the schedule there so that you could see it. Um, when you come in here for the, the practical next week, um, I'm going to um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm going to shut off access to Blackboard for everybody. Um, and so I will definitely hold off on doing that until after – uh, everybody's here. So it won't be at 135, it'll be 230 when you come in. But that is the absolute end of uh, the semester for you as far as any work on Blackboard's concerned. So you have to get everything done by before then. Um, <clears throat> the material in this week's folder, the part one, two, three, and four assignments, um, are due, uh, I guess, the 12th, technically. Um, but everything else is past due. Um, and so for all assignments, except for the nervous system assignments, um, part one, two, three, and four assignments de uh, depend on the previous one for you to complete it. So if you're doing work late uh, and you do, say, part one of the nervous tissue or uh, part one of, uh, you know, the cellular level of organization, whatever, uh, <clears throat> that'll be marked late and it won't let you go on to the next part until I check it off. Um, it has to look at your score, you know, you have to get at least 80% correct to move on, and when you do something late, it the score is uh, not posted in the gradebook section of the um, course until I check it off. So um, <clears throat> it won't let you go on to the next thing. You've probably already run into that. Um, in the course, but I just want to remind you of that in case you have been on top of doing everything, you want to just go back and do stuff, uh, or you have a few things to catch up on. Because of that, it's going to take you a little bit longer to get some stuff done. Because you do an assignment, you can't go on to the next assignment until I check it off. And then you go on to the next assignment, you can't go on to the next one until I check it off. And then you move on, and then you got to wait for me to check off the next one for parts one, two, three, and four. Um, so don't put everything off until the 12th. Don't say, okay, everything's due by tomorrow. I better get started on it now because you won't finish things. Okay? I'm not going to be going on to Blackboard every 10 minutes to check on what needs to be checked off. Um, you're welcome to email or text me and say I'm waiting for something to be checked off, but I can't necessarily get that to that right away. So uh, um, if you do something and you're waiting for the next assignment, uh, waiting to go on to the next assignment, you text me and say, I'm waiting for this. I might not get to it until later that day. And then you do the next one, you text me and say, you're waiting for the next one. I might not get to that till the next morning, okay? Um, so you should have already been putting the work in, but if you haven't, uh, don't put things off till the last minute. If you are dealing with waiting for stuff to get done, um, work, um, Smartly. Uh, don't do one assignment and say, well, I can't go on to the next assignment, so I'm going to go do something else. Do other work here. Get it out of the way. If you have four or five chapters worth of assignments that you're trying to get done, do all the part one stuff. Okay, Get those out of the way, and then you're waiting for all those to move on. Um, don't say, well, i got to do all this chapter, and then I'll do all of that chapter, because then you're waiting for a lot of things to be checked off. If there's work available for you to do, do it. Also, if there's already things that you have completed, uh, the, the assignments that you get multiple attempts on, go back and do them over if you don't have 100% on them yet. Um, and for part one, two, three assignments, 
Um, it's best if you do those in reverse order if you've already done them. So if you've already gone through and done chapter assignments, but you didn't get 100% on the part one, two, three assignments, go back and do them over. It's just going to help your grade, um, especially if you're waiting for me to check off other work so that you can go on. Um, but do part three first because uh, when you start a new assignment or when you start a new attempt on an assignment, it'll hide the link for the next assignment. So if you do part three, it'll hide the link to part four, which you've already done, and that's okay. Then you go to do part two, and it hides the link to part three, but you just did part three because you were doing it in reverse order. And then when you finish part two, go back to do part one, and it'll hide the link to part two. If you do part one first, you won't be able to go on to part two right away. Now, this is if you've already done the chapter assignments. If you haven't done the chapter assignments, obviously you have to do them in order. But uh, if you're going back to redo things, say you didn't get the tissue level of organization assignments up to 100%, then uh, go back and do them over. Just since you already have access to them, it would be best to um, uh, do them in reverse order, just for the sake of getting everything done properly. Um, so that's just referring to what I have here in the schedule. I do want to go to um, this week's folder. Uh, I actually changed things up a little bit as far as the folder is concerned. Um, week 12 in the schedule I just showed you said nervous system, and then week 13 was neurological correlates. Um, and so I put those two together in this title because, uh, well, of what I'm about to show you in a second. But uh, what was the week 12 folder is really just um, this stuff here up to nervous system makeup assignment. Um, there's a part one, two, three, and four assignment, which is uh, based on the chapters for this particular week. Um, it starts with Unit 3, Chapter 2, but actually if you read this, it tells you to go on and look at the next chapter also. Um, hmm. The numbers look a little weird to me there. But anyways, uh, <clears throat> here in the book, um, what we did last week and the week before was about the nervous system and nervous tissue stuff. Um, this week we're doing the uh, nervous system anatomy represented by this chapter here, which is the one that we've, that the link took us to. And then also the following chapter on the somatic nervous system um, <clears throat> is relevant. Chapter two in unit three is basically the anatomy part of um, the nervous system. And then chapter three in unit three is the somatic function stuff. Um, so that those kind of go together. I've separated the functions into somatic and autonomic chapters because the autonomic chapter is actually something for AMP2. Um, <clears throat> so the part one, two, three, and four assignments that are in this week's folder are essentially about this chapter here, although there might be some references to this chapter. Um, but uh, they really kind of work with each other for the most part. Um, but also in this folder, I change it up. So after the uh, nervous system makeup assignment, uh, it then has another thing that says this week's goals. These three, I just copied out of the actual week 13 folder. Um, <clears throat> and it's a link to chapter five in unit three, which is about the, you guys done? Um, which is about the neurological exam, which is the other thing we're going to be doing next uh, tomorrow. Um, and then a website that goes with that. So there's no assignments in this group of stuff. So our next week folder, which I've just copied over into this folder, so they're all in one place, isn't adding any assignments to anything. It's just uh, the assignments for this week are the nervous system assignments and uh, the cranial nerve lab quiz stuff. Um, <clears throat> if you go into the weekly folder section, um, you'll see um, <clears throat> the folder I was just in, week 12, 
and I added in the neurological correlate stuff, which is really just the stuff that's in the week 13 folder. So if you look in this folder, you'll just see those three things that were at the bottom of the page I was just showing you. Um, there's no more assignments in that folder. The next week folder link here actually takes you to the lab practical and cumulative final folder. So this is where the outline and the cases for uh, the practical are found. And then there's an online assignment and uh, for the practical, um, and then the cumulative final assignment. Uh, the first three things here about the practical, uh, it's exactly the same as the first practical you took back in March or whenever that was. Um, so the outline and the cases help you prepare for that. There are four cases. Um, for this practical, it's about the musculature and the nervous system. So two of the cases are about muscles and two are about nervous system. Now, musculature and nervous system are a little harder to separate out. They're uh, interdependent uh, systems. Uh, we're trying to figure out about neurological function. Really, the only way we can figure out what's happening is by somebody's response. And voluntary responses from the nervous system are always carried out by skeletal muscles. So. Uh, the, the two systems really kind of uh, are intertwined pretty well. But cases one and two are primarily about the muscular side of things, and cases three and four are about the nervous system side of things, um, which will help you kind of hopefully make sense of those uh, cases a bit more. Um, <clears throat> next week on the 13th, you'll be taking the in-class portion of that practical, 50 multiple choice question test. Um, <clears throat> with a dozen or so questions per case. Um, and I'll have the um, um, station set up around the outside of the room uh, like before. And for some of those questions, you'll go to the case, uh, to the station and answer the questions about that. Exactly the same setup as before. Um, also in this folder is the cumulative final assignment. Um, that is the final exam for the class. It's a 50 multiple choice question test. Um, worth 50 points. Um, and I believe I've talked about this before, right? Okay, so there, the questions are all questions from part one and two assignments from this whole semester. There are not any uh, new questions made specifically for that. Um, <clears throat> as I've been explaining this to all my classes over and over again, I've been thinking, hey, it would actually be kind of good to have some big questions put in there, but that won't apply to you. Okay. In the future, I might do that, but. Uh, for you, it's it's all built out of questions from the assignments you already had. Uh, and I talked about how to prepare for that. Uh, in the sentence there underneath the assignment link, it says you have three attempts for this assignment. The best of the score, three scores will be the one that actually that uh, is used to calculate your grade. Um, so unless you get all 50 questions correct, do it again. Okay. Um, if you don't, if you get a better score on the next attempt, then that's going to improve your score. If you get a worse score, it won't affect anything. The better of the three scores, best of the three scores is what goes in the grade book. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions being used to build that assignment, all of the questions from all of those assignments all semester. Um, so probably the three attempts that you have will be completely different from each other. Um, but. Uh, uh, <coughs> Just the best of the three is the one that goes in the grade book. Okay. So um, it would be worth it to go ahead and uh, make all three attempts on that. Uh, if you do worse on a, a later attempt, it doesn't bring your score down. The best of the three is what goes in there. Um, I think that's everything that I need to cover. Yeah. So you, we have to wait for you to grade the cumulative final. Yeah. It'll automatically grade itself. Just like the part one and two assignments. Okay. It's all multiple choice, so it's all out of curriculum. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so it's the ones with the short answer that you have to wait for grades on, basically. Um, the, the, like the part four assignments. Right. So fill in the blank type so things blank. are auto corrected also. This is only multiple choice, so no Got fill it. in the blank questions. Here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Can you um, like update the assignments because I don't have the grades like all the time? Oh. Um, I might not have. Uh, in the past couple of weeks. Um, my plan is to go through and make sure that's updated tomorrow for all my classes. Um, 
<clears throat> I know some of them I have updated, but I'm going to make sure on all of them tomorrow that they're updated. No more. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> other questions about what's happening and wrapping up the semester here? It's almost over, right? Uh, no, for you, we're going to stay on for another couple of months. Just for you. Anyways. Yes. On, uh, the outline, it said there was a muscle standout. Oh, yeah. Um, that's uh, from before now. It's just the muscles that are list covered in that chapter um, at the end of that unit. So, actually, yeah. Uh, in the support and movement section of the book, um, there's the muscle tissue chapter, which is about how contraction works. And then there's the muscle system chapter, which is about the specific muscles. So I no longer hand out a, a list of muscles. Uh, instead, it's just the muscles that are covered in that chapter. Um, but uh, really, in preparation, pay attention to what muscles are addressed in the cases primarily. Um, and then if you have time to study more, pay attention to the muscles that I stressed more than others. Things that are going to be set up around the room, are they going to do, have more to do with the cases? Um, as much as they can. So, uh, muscle things that are talking to cases are probably going to be up here? Could be. Um, like, but uh, in the first practical, there were two microscopes out. Um, one of the cases was about tissues. Um, one of the microscopes was showing you a, micro, a micrograph of. No, sorry, showing you a microscope slide of the esophagus stomach border because in the case she had GERD, so it was addressing the, the epithelia there. The other one was actually of the bladder, which had nothing to do with the case, um, but I actually was putting, that was a question from the microscope practice so I put on there. Um, so I try to make them about the case, but sometimes there's something I want to show. Uh, use a pre uh, station to show you, and it might not be. Yeah. When you say uh, muscles, you stressed like um, when we did the muscles, we did like our we present we did our videos. So when you say that, like what what muscles? So aside from the muscles that are specifically mentioned there, any any muscles that I talked about uh, more in class, which actually there's not no. too many, but uh, but yeah. Like if I spend some time talking about it in class, it might be something worth getting now. Well, you've got uh, you've got notes, I'm sure. So. Other questions? Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's go to um, the nervous system material here. Uh, it starts off with a section, oh, to, before you get on to this, um, we're going to be looking at, talking about the brain, so I want you to be able to look at models of the brain. Um, so, uh, um, sorry, somebody put pieces of tape on this one, which really upsets me. Um, but, uh, anyways, um, there are six models of the brain up here, and then I'm about to grab, I think, four out of a, a cabinet in the back there, um, which would be a total of ten. There are more than ten of you in this room, but there should be enough that you and the person sitting next to you can look on together. Um, also, uh, there are fewer of these, but there are these models here, um, and I'm going to be talking about this, and I'd like for you to have that handy uh, when I'm talking about it so you can visualize what I'm saying. So go ahead and grab uh, uh, Freddy models um, from off that or from or back here. Thank <laughs> you. 
There are also a couple more models back here. Uh, you can get one. Thank you, Star So uh, I just wanted to have you grab those. So as I'm talking about some of the structure of the uh, brain, you have it in front of you to, to see what I'm talking about. Um, before we get to actually looking at those too much, um, I do want to start this off by talking about um, how the nervous system originally develops in the embryo. Um, I don't usually talk about developmental processes in this class because the focus is really on the adult systems and we're looking at, we really want to pay attention to the mature uh, structure more than anything else. But I think looking at the embryological brain is helpful because uh, when it's really simple in structure, uh, it's easier to get uh, a handle on what's going on, and it'll help you understand some things that are confusing when you're just looking at the adult brain. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about a few different stages in development of the um, nervous system, um, starting with what's called the neural tube. So uh, in this picture, we're looking at um, a section of the very early embryo, and at this point the embryo uh, has no discerning features as far as the body plan. Um, it's just sort of this peanut-shaped thing, uh, and it's certainly not even as big as a peanut, but um, <clears throat> it has actually in it an inherent uh, body plan, it's just not visible yet. Uh, the first thing that really kind of starts to lay out that body plan is along the back, what's going to end up being the dorsal surface of the embryo, um, part of the outer surface of the embryo starts to fold in. So the outer layer, this tissue right here, um, is called the ectoderm. The label is actually down here, but um, it just means outside tissue. Okay? But this specific area right here starts to change, and the cells change their shape, causing a fold to form or a groove. Um, and this is where the nervous system is going to develop. And so here, um, the uh, tissue that sort of folds in from the ectoderm is called the neuroectoderm. Um, <clears throat> just the this part of that tissue that's specialized for the nervous system. Um, and so in these figures, which are kind of just sections through, uh, we see that uh, infolding sort of closing up and making a tube, which is hollow. There's a little space in the middle. Um, it's not empty. There's some fluid in there, but uh, <clears throat> there aren't cells in the middle there. Um, and that runs all along the dorsal surface here. Um, it's certainly not evident in this structure of the embryo, but there is an anterior and a posterior side to it. Um, one end is anterior, which is where the head's going to develop, and then the other end is posterior, where the tail's going to develop. Now, humans don't have tails, but in the embryonic development, there is a tail um, that resorbs and is not present in the so-called uh, mature human, although it's not present at birth even. Um, but that's how things are laid out. The limbs are going to grow off from either side. So the legs will grow off back here next to where the tail will be, and the arms will grow off here closer to where the head's going to grow out. But we don't see any of that now. And we're actually, we're not going to deal with that aspect of embryological development. I'm just sort of showing you the body plan. What we are interested in is how this tube, the neural tube going down the back of the embryo, um, lays out the um, nervous system. And so the next step to look at is when that tube starts to get a little bit more complex into what we call the primary vesicles and the secondary vesicles. Um, 
<clears throat> so in this picture, we're looking at the tube, but we're looking at the anterior end of the tube, which might be most, you know, the front half of the tube or thereabouts. Uh, but this is the part that's going to end up being the brain. The rest of the tube, what we see a little bit uh, at the end of the picture here, continues on being the um, becoming the spinal cord portion. Now, the spinal cord isn't really that different from a tube to begin with, but the brain gets much more complex because of these vesicles. And essentially what happens is the tube structure changes as different areas kind of balloon out into what are called vesicles. Um, in this uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, frontal section view of that, we can see the wall of the tube here. These, there are cells here. There's not a whole lot of cells yet. They're going to grow in, and all of this is going to become much more complex. But at this stage, uh, it's a very thin wall of tissue, and still there's empty space in the middle. Now, the primary vesicles, uh, which is evident uh, within the third or fourth week of development, uh, <clears throat> are named, uh, as we see here, to distinguish between three different regions. These names are all in Greek. Uh, encephalon is saying in all of the words that we see here. And encephalon means in the head. Seph means head. So enceph is referring to in the head, and therefore it's talking about the brain. The prefixes that we see here just modify what part of the brain it is. The prosencephalon is called the forebrain. And in Greek, prose basically means before. Um, and so it's the, the front part of the before part of the brain. And then mes means mid, so mesencephalon is the midbrain. And then the rhombencephalon is called the hindbrain. That's actually not a direct translation of rhombencephalon but we don't really care what romb really means here. Uh, it really is describing its shape. But in relation to the forebrain and the midbrain, hindbrain is the appropriate. Now, when we're talking about the brain, sometimes we do think about the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain regions. But um, we want to look at the secondary vesicle stage uh, to get a little bit more detail. What happens here is the three vesicles, three primary vesicles, change into five secondary vesicles, really because the forebrain separates into two distinct regions and the hindbrain separates into two distinct regions. The midbrain actually doesn't change too much. What we'll see when we get to the adult brain is that the midbrain is actually a pretty small region um, and the other things sort of grow up around it. Um, <clears throat> And in how these things grow and how they're related to each other, we'll understand some things about what the adult brain looks like. So the five vesicles that we see here, the secondary vesicles, we have the telencephalon, which is what becomes region of the adult brain that we call the cerebrum. And then the diencephalon, which gives rise to a number of structures, uh, but we still call it the diencephalon. There's just not a better word for the Greek than the Greek name for that. Um, but Basically, the diencephalon includes anything with the word thalamus in its name, for the most part. Uh, and the two that we're going to think about the most are the thalamus itself and the hypothalamus. Um, so those are two important diencephalic structures uh, that we'll think about. I put epithalamus in here not because it's terribly important in um, what we're learning this semester, but it does come up next semester. So I just wanted to point out where it came from uh, in the development here. Also, there's a structure that's called the eye cup. Obviously, it doesn't have the word thalamus in it, but um, it's an important thing that develops out of the diencephalon. It's the nervous tissue component to the eye, which is what we call the retina. Um, <clears throat> it develops out of the central nervous system, but then it extends out from the diencephalon and connective tissue starts to grow around it, making everything from the white part of the eye and the um, lens and all those sorts of things to the bone growing around the brain and around the eyeball. So in the end, the eye ends up being in a peripheral 
position because it's outside of the cranium, it's in the orbit itself. But actually the fact that it grows out of the central nervous system originally helps us understand its connections. What we'll see is the eye cup or the, the retina is most directly connected to the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, it's actually not connected to the epithalamus, but there's a very important uh, visual component that plays into epithalamus function. Um, <clears throat> Now, visual function, we usually think of it as, you know, what we can see. But actually, that's not all of visual function. Uh, visual function can be sort of separated into what we think of as um, our conscious perceptions of the world around us and our subconscious or unconscious or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, visual processing. The thalamus is responsible for the uh, conscious side of things. Um, so everything that you see is actually processed through the thalamus. Um, that's eventually going to be sent from the thalamus to the cerebrum, but the retina projects to the thalamus. Okay? The, th the retina also projects to the hypothalamus, which is where the majority of your subconscious visual processing takes place. Um, there's more to it than the examples I'm about to give you, but they're a good uh, representation of that. If your eyes are exposed to a bright light, the pupils will get smaller, restricting as much how much light gets in, which helps to protect the retina. Um, so, for instance, if I move in front of the screen here, now the the light bulb and the projector there is shining in my eyes very brightly. And so, as as soon as I walk in front of that, my pupils constrict and the hypothalamus is receiving the visual information, the brightness of the light, and uh, using that to direct the reflexive response of um, the uh, <clears throat> pupillary constriction. Um, also, the hypothalamus is responsible for processing the brightness of light uh, in the sense of sunlight versus artificial light. And from that, the hypothalamus sends information on, actually to the epithalamus, um, letting that part of our brain know when it's day or night. And that part of our brain, the epithalamus, is more commonly referred to as the pineal gland, which re releases a hormone called melatonin. Um, melatonin is released when you're not receiving a strong daylight signal. Um, and it's basically the signal to your body that it's nighttime. And it helps you regulate the 24-hour cycle of the day. Um, so that's processed through the diencephalon, whether it's the visual component, I mean the conscious component that goes through uh, the thalamus or the so-called unconscious component or subconscious component that goes through the hypothalamus. Um, there is actually a little bit of the midbrain that plays a role in visual functioning, which the book refers to, but I'm not going to go into that at all here. Um, but that's not a big stretch because it's right next to the um, diencephalon. So these are the structures that get visual information. Um, and then anywhere else in the nervous system that needs visual information has to get it through these things here. Okay. Um, and in fact, diencephalon can be translated to mean through brain, it's sort of the part of the brain that everything has to pass through, really between the cerebrum and uh, the hindbrain regions. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we see happening in the secondary vesicle stage is the rhombencephalon, the hindbrain, separates into two vesicles called the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. The metencephalon becomes two structures in the adult brain. One's called the pons and the other's called the cerebellum. Um, and the myelencephalon becomes what's called the medulla or the medulla oblongata. Um, I'm not going to refer to it by that full name because there's really actually nothing else in uh, the nervous system that we need to deal with with medulla in its name. So uh, um, if you hear me referring to the medulla, that's what we're talking about. Um, and actually, other than people trying to sound like they know what they're talking about in the brain, like Adam Sandler in Waterboy, um, or the character in that, 
Uh, most people don't refer to it by its full name. It's just called the Medulla. Um, <clears throat> I actually wanted to just leave Medulla in there and, and drop Oblongata, but the um, uh, editor wouldn't let me do that. So um, it's in there. Now, um, I want to go to uh, looking at the brain model for a second. So we'll talk about I should have grabbed one of these while I was back there. Um, when we look at the adult brain, uh, there's essentially four regions, four major regions. And where they are, we can kind of correspond to what we have here. And in fact, the names are all, for the most part, here. Um, it's easiest to see these if we look at half of the brain model. Uh, so if you're sharing a brain model with somebody, then obviously there are two halves, and uh, you can both look at one. Um, the cerebrum, what uh, the telencephalon becomes, is the major part of what we see in the brain. It's this big wrinkly part here. In fact, it's more than just the big wrinkly part. There's stuff deep inside of it that's also cerebellum. The surface that we can see here is called the cerebral cortex, the outer covering. Um, and after this, what we're going to do is talk more about the structure of the cerebral cortex um, in the next section of the book. But um, that's all of the outer stuff we can see here. It's, it ends up being really big. One of the things that's important in distinguishing, um, well, various mammals from each other is how much the cerebrum grows. Um, if you look at the three-week embryo, the forebrain, is actually fairly small compared to, you know, say, the hindbrain region. But when you get to the adult brain, the forebrain's huge, and that's because it just grows exponentially and fills in all of the space that it can. The reason that it's all wrinkled up is because it's trying to fit as much stuff into the cranial cavity as possible. Um, and so, all of these wrinkles are really just where the tissue had nowhere else to go, so it sort of folded in. Um, if we were to flatten out the surface of the cerebrum as a sheet, uh, it would come out to be a really pretty big piece of tissue. Right? And your mother's very thankful that this is not how big your brain is. Right? Um, really, the, the trade-off there um, is trying to get the head to be small enough to pass through the, the birth canal. And even then, you know, it's not the most uh, enjoyable part of birth, uh, childbirth, I'm sure. Not that I have any personal experience with that, but. Um, <clears throat> so the cerebrum is really this, the majority of what we have there. The diencephalon is really just what we see right here, kind of in the middle of the forebrain. Um, on your model, you have either a yellow dot or a brown dot right there in the middle. Um, that dot is not all of the thalamus, but that's in the thalamus. The thalamus is about the size of the last joint in your thumb. And there's one on the right, one on the left. They touch just a little bit in the middle. So that little dot there is where the two thalami, which is plural thalamus, uh, touch the middle. Um, and just in front of that, you should see a little ridge or groove um, that groove separates the thalamus from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is below the thalamus, which is what hypothalamus means, but it's also a little bit anterior to it. And it comes to kind of a point right here. Okay. So all of this area right here is the diencephalon. The thalamus I'm sort of covering up with my finger right now here, and the hypothalamus I'm covering up now, but it's where it comes to a point. You may or may not have a model that has a little peanut-sized thing hanging off from the hypothalamus. If you do, that is the pituitary gland. Okay. There's only one pituitary gland, so you might not have one on what you're looking at if you're sharing it with somebody else. Their half might have the pituitary gland on it. But also in these models, the pituitary gland is attached by a very thin little piece of wire, which breaks pretty easily. So not all of the models even have it on there. But um, uh, so it's a little peanut thing that looks like it's hanging off the bottom. Oh, I see. Very small. Yeah. Do you have one there? Here. Here. Right here, right? All right. <laughs> 
No, you don't have one. Oh, okay. Is it this if side? there's a peanut that's attached with a Y, it's like that's this it. Here. This way. Yeah. That's oh, one. okay. I see. It's fallen off a number of these because right. that wire connection is not perfect. But um, <clears throat> no, you don't where that's attached is the um, sort of the tip of the hypothalamus there in these models. Um, <clears throat> so that area right in the middle, which I can kind of cover up completely with my finger right there, that's the diencephalon. The midbrain is sort of what's just adjacent to that. Okay? Um, you should see a little groove going through the middle of the part right next to that, uh, right next to the thalamus. Um, on one side, it has some bumps on it. On the other side, it's just uh, um, the little pocket there underneath the hypothalamus. That's the midbrain. It's really small relative to the overall brain size, um, which is misleading based on the early uh, three vesicle, three primary vesicle stage, because there it seems to be a big part of the brain. It's its, it's own parts, its own vesicle but it really doesn't grow a whole lot much more uh, compared to the other parts of the brain. So it ends up being a really small part right there. Um, the pons is easiest to understand or recognize because there's um, this oval structure right here. Right? Um, the word pons actually means bridge, and it's a bridge from one side of the cere cerebellum to the other side of the brain. Um, and that oval there is that bridge. It's a big piece of white matter that's connecting one side of, to the other. Um, the pons, however, as far as part of the brain here, includes the gray matter that's adjacent to that um, oval. Okay? So if I put my finger here over the mid, uh, midbrain, I'm right at the top of that oval. If I put my finger here at the bottom of that oval, um, between my two fingers, that's the pons right in there. And then from the bottom of the oval down is the medulla until it reaches the um, uh, spinal cord there. Um, those three things together, the midbrain, pons, and medulla, make up what we call the brain stem, right, which is the third of the major parts of the adult brain. So there's the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, which is the uh, midbrain, pons, and medulla. And then the fourth part is the um, cerebellum, which is pretty easy to tell apart from everything else because it's the small wrinkly thing that looks like a little itty bitty cerebrum. And that's in fact what cerebellum means. It's a diminutive form of the word cerebrum, so it means a little brain. Okay. Now, uh, what I like about using the embryonic brain to get to know the layout of the adult brain a little bit really comes from the fact that um, the connections are more obvious here. Um, the cerebellum is connected to the pons, which makes sense because they both grow out of the metencephalon. Uh, the cerebellum is a really big structure, so it's, it's got a little bit more of a connection, but there's a little bit of the cerebellum that connects to the midbrain and a little bit of the cerebellum that connects to the medulla. But that's it. It grows out of this area, so it's not going to be able to connect very far past that area. If something needs to communicate between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, it has to go through all of the intervening structures. So cerebrum to diencephalon to midbrain to pons to cerebellum or cerebellum to midbrain through diencephalon to cerebrum. Okay. In the model, you'll see the cerebrum and the cerebellum seem to be right next to each other right here. But any connections between the two have to go around through all of the structures. Okay. Actually, there's a piece of connective tissue um, extending off from the, the skull that fits right in between the two. So there's physically no connection between the cerebrum and the cerebellum directly there. Any information has to go around uh, through the uh, diencephalon and the brainstem to get there. And that's pretty obvious that we see here because of how they develop. Okay. And the connections are sort of maintained based on these embryonic uh, connections 
in the adult. Um, I already actually told you the other thing that's useful here, which is the connections of the retina back to the brain. Uh, we're not going to talk about the uh, special senses like vision and telepathy too, but when we get there, it'll make sense that the retina is connected to the thalamus and the hypothalamus primarily because they're all developing out of the diencephalon. The cortex processes visual information that we're aware of. But it doesn't get any information. I'm hearing a lot of electronic things going off in here today, so please keep everything silent. Um, if you're surfing on the web while you're waiting for me, understand that ads and that sort of thing have an a audio component to them, and that can be distracting. So please lay off that a little bit. It's getting in the way of me getting through this, and if you're surfing because you're bored, you're going to get even more bored as I stop to talk about you surfing and your fingerprints, and please turn off the electronic devices. Okay, um, so your visual perception uh, starts in the cerebrum, but it doesn't actually get any direct information from the eyeballs, from the retina. It has to go through the thalamus, okay? And that's another thing we can see looking at uh, um, embryonic development that's not terribly obvious from uh, the structure of the adult brain. So I like to use this just to set up the adult structures of the brain so that you can understand where they come from a little bit. Um, there's more to talk about the spinal cord development here, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, this picture here gets to a really weird um, issue when we're talking about the human. Um, <coughs> The neuraxis, or the line that we go from anterior to posterior through the nervous system, actually has to bend in humans. So I have a picture of a dog here to represent a four-legged animal, um, which actually would apply to a fish or anything like that, too. Um, but based on embryonic development, anterior is one end and posterior is the other, you know, head to tail layout. Uh, for humans, head to tail layout is... Uh, changed because of our uh, bipedal nature, the fact that we're standing on two feet. Um, if we were four-legged animals just like a dog, we'd be you know, down like this. And our heads would have to be pointing forward to be able to see. But since we stand up, our heads have actually rotated. If our heads were in the same position as a four-legged animal while we're standing up straight, and we'd be looking straight up like that. And that would be a straight line through the nervous system. So because we have uh, a bipedal stance, um, our nervous system actually kind of rotates or changes uh, direction so that our eyes are looking forward. So this is anterior when we're talking about the nervous system, and this is posterior when we're talking about the, the nervous system also. Um, when we're talking about it in relation to the body as a whole, we stick with the, the overall body directions. But um, <clears throat> if I talk about the most anterior part of the nervous system, I'm talking about the very front of the brain. When I'm talking about the most posterior part of the nervous system, I'm talking about the end of the spinal cord. I'm talking about the most posterior part of the brain, then I'm talking about the other side here, because that's posterior relative to the body. But, so there's a little quirk here look, considering the human nervous system because of the fact that we stand on two feet. Um, the other thing uh, I want to point out, uh, well, first off, this table here kind of lays out a lot of the information that I just went through based on the figures there. Uh, there's one last thing I want to mention, which is what comes of the empty space in the neur neural tube. Um, and that gives rise to structures called ventricles. And the other model that I pointed out that I said I wanted you to have access to, and there are fewer of them, so uh, hopefully you're sitting near one of these. This is what's called a ventricular cast. Okay. Um, this is mass produced. So what I'm about to describe isn't how this particular thing was made. But originally, the, the model for this came from filling the empty spaces in the middle of the brain and the spinal cord with, pla or I should say the brain, with plastic, okay? That plastic solidified and then all of the tissue was removed. So this shape was cast in the space within the brain. And, sorry, 
Um, I had a brain section out to show you, but put away. Um, so the empty space down the middle of the neural tube is still there in the adult brain. It just it changed its shape a little bit because of how the brain develops. So here's a section of a brain. And we can see this kind of, let me hold it this way, this kind of Y-shaped space in the middle there. Those are ventricles. Okay. Um, and this is a uh, transverse or horizontal section through the brain. Uh, so trying to interpret what you're seeing there in respect to what's here, it's kind of a section through the brain at this level here. Um, the Y shape that I just pointed out is this is the middle part of the Y, and then these two point off to the side of the arms of the Y. Um, those are ventricles that are inside the brain. Um, you can kind of imagine where these fit inside of the whole brain model by kind of superimposing these things on each other. Okay, so from the side, the um, ventricular cache would be lined up with the brain kind of like that, or from the front kind of like that. Okay. Um, now, sometimes uh, looking at these kind of weird things um, ends up being a lot like an ink blot test. So you look at something and it, it looks like something to you, but then when you tell people what, you, what it looks like, you know, that's sort of like some weird picture of your inner uh, personality. So I'm going to share that with you for a second. The ventricular cast, to me, I interpret as looking like a rooster with a pompadour. Right? Rooster with a pompadour. That's a pompadour. A hairstyle. Yeah, it's a hairstyle. Sort of like a... Like Elvis. Yeah, like Elvis or oh. 50s rock kind of thing. <laughs> so if you're looking at this thing, in the middle, there's a hole through the cast. That's the eye of the rooster. And then um, it comes to kind of a point right here, which would be the rooster's feet. Sorry? <laughs> Too abstract for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> actually, it seems very concrete to me. So uh, where the eye is and where the beak is, and then the neck coming off down here. Then the pompadour is just the big curve thing that is in the top. Um, now, <laughs> having oriented you to my interpretation of what this cast looks like, uh, let me just tell you what the things are. Okay. So the two things on either side that are the pompadour are called the lateral ventricles. And they're found in the cerebrum. Okay. And in fact, for what I showed you there with the actual brain slice, that was they're the uh, arms of the Y, as I've got it set up here. Um, they are found throughout the entire brain. Um, <coughs> Cerebrum, I should say. Uh, this. So the front here kind of corresponds to the front of the brain, and then it sort of curves back and points towards the back of the brain here. That's this part. And then where it comes along the side, it's going into this little part right there. So it kind of follows the shape of the brain there. And in fact, that shape of the brain comes from the fact that the brain's growing into the skull. So, um, oh, I took the picture down. Um, the palencephalon we see here, um, and you can kind of see from the side here, this is growing into the cranial space. The light blue part that looks kind of like the bottom jaw of this weird creature, um, that's the diencephalon. The telencephalon is a lighter colored top part. That's going to expand immensely and fill up the, the cranial space and really fold over and hide the diencephalon and, for that matter, the midbrain inside of it. Um, <clears throat> it grows forward towards uh, your forehead region it runs into the bone there, and it has to grow back towards the occipital bone here. 
it runs into that and it's not done growing so it starts to fold underneath and grows in on either side uh, sort of next to your temporal bones there um, and so as it's growing like that the um, lateral ventricles follow that shape too so into uh, the frontal area where their forehead is then back towards the occipital and then into the temporal region there so this shape kind of follows the shape of the brain as it fits into that space those ventricles can be considered the first and second ventricles, although we don't call them first and second. They're just the lateral ventricle. Um, and I mention that because the next part, which is the head of the rooster, is the third ventricle. It's in the diencephalon region. So where the two halves of your model come together, here where the thalamus and the hypothalamus are, that's actually a little bit of a gap from one side to the other. Where the little hole is, I'm sorry, where the little hole is in the ventricular cast is where the yellow or brown spot that I pointed out originally goes. Okay. But other than that spot, all of the space um, of the diencephalon is empty. That's a ventricle there. And the beak of the rooster here is sort of pointing down into where the um, hypothalamus is. Okay. So the hypothalamus would be here, where when I'm covering up with my fingers, the beak part of my rooster. And then the thalamus would be the other part here, that's better, um, sort of where the eye is. Okay. So I was using my rooster example with uh, one of my other AP1 classes, and I had students that just didn't believe me. They didn't like it. But uh, I go with the rooster because the shape of the hypothalamus setting up the beak structure is an important part of understanding what things are. Then the neck part of the rooster is what's called the cerebral aqueduct. Um, uh, hold on a second. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Really hard to work a keyboard upside down. Um, I just use mouse. Tell the easiest. Uh, so over here, okay. Uh, the cerebral aqueduct. There's the title right there. Um, aqueduct means to carry water. Aqua for water, duct for to carry. So uh, fluid moves between the third ventricle and the next part called the fourth ventricle along that. That's passing through the midbrain. So um, if you sort of find that color dot that I pointed out, sort of straight down from that, or at least a little angle, there's a groove that goes through the midbrain region. That's the cerebral aqueduct right there. Um, based on the model, it looks very small relative to, based on the brain model, it looks very small relative to the um, ventricular cast. And the ventricular cast is going to make it look big because the, the plastic as it hardened in there is going to expand and just sort of push out on the cerebral aqueduct. But it is really a small uh, little channel going from the third ventricle of the diencephalon into the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle is really the space between the brain stem and the cerebellum. Okay. In the hard plastic model like I'm using here to describe things, the fourth ventricle looks pretty huge. In the soft, squishy plastic one, uh, it looks a little bit smaller, but it's the space between the cerebellum, which would be right here, and the rest of the brain stem, which would be, this is really hard to hold with two hands. But, so this is the brain stem, and this is the cerebellum, and the fourth ventricle is sort of in between the two. Um, <clears throat> now, in the book, it goes into talking about that stuff a little bit more and uh, the fact that there's a sort of circulatory system within the brain um, that uses what's called cerebrospinal fluid, um, and that moves through these structures here. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about that today, but if not, uh, I'll rely on your reading the book to get that. Um, the other thing, uh, which is not terribly important, in the spinal cord, which is the posterior neural tube, um, there's the central canal. When I was showing you the tissue a couple of classes before, um, 
I showed you the uh, gray matter, white matter, and the spinal cord, and there's a little hole in the middle of the gray matter. That's the central canal. It's really small. Um, it's barely the width of a needle. Um, and uh, other than the fact there is a little hole in the middle of the spinal cord, it doesn't do a whole lot. Um, the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't flow through the, cerebr the uh, central canal of the spinal cord. It is in there, but it's sort of a cul-de-sac. It's a dead end. The, the fluid doesn't really come out of that. Instead, the fluid comes out at the, the fourth ventricle into the out exterior space around the brain and spinal cord. Um, and again, the book uh, goes into that in more depth, which I'll uh, hopefully get to talk about a little bit later on, but if I don't, um, you can uh, use the book to get that. But that kind of finishes off the um, embryonic stuff. There is a box in here just uh, talking about some developmental disorders um, of the nervous system. But I want to move on to talk more about the uh, adult system. Now, in the next section, which is the central nervous system, it goes through the four major parts of the, of the adult brain. There's the cerebrum. The diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. And then, so those are all the brain, and then it has the spinal cord after that. Um, what I want to do today is concentrate on the cerebrum and really concentrate just on the cerebral cortex. Um, <clears throat> what I've been doing for my other classes is um, there's more in this section uh, after the cerebral cortex cortex, uh, stuff that's deep inside the cerebrum, but I've been saving that for the uh, second lecture, which we'll do tomorrow. Um, so I'll probably stick with that, um, but we'll see how things play out exactly. I might I might get to that today. Um, let's think here. Okay. Uh, what we're going to be looking at really with the brain, this is why you have the model there in front of you, is to get to know the structure of the cerebral cortex. I described briefly how the cerebrum grows into, or the telencephalon grows into the cranial space. And it's trying to fit as much tissue in there as possible, and so it gets all of these wrinkles all over it. Um, and looking at those wrinkles, there are uh, consistent landmarks that everybody's brain has that help us find the different parts of the brain. And so that's what we want to look at. But before we start looking at those wrinkles, the biggest feature to show you um, is just the big split down the middle of the brain. Okay. Uh, so if you're looking at the surface of the cerebrum, it's got all these wrinkles. But there's obviously one really big groove going all the way down midline. Um, and what that is is it's really just you know the mid line point in the telencephalon, the two sides grow out and fill in all that cranial space. And that groove remains behind is what we see there. It's called the longitudinal fissure. Okay, longitudinal because it's going the length of the brain and fissure is just means big cracks. If we were looking at real brains, we could take fingers or probes or whatever and pass them down into the longitudinal fissure and not run into any resistance for a while because, as you can see, when you look at just half of the brain on the medial surface, the wrinkly stuff on the outside continues along on the medial surface for a little while. Then it gets to um, this structure here, which is uh, painted white in the hard plastic model, and um, I think it's more gray looking in the soft plastic model, but that's a big piece of white matter. It's called the um, corpus callosum. And actually the first picture here is showing you its basic location. So here's the longitudinal fissure, the big crack down the middle of the brain. And if we went inside, we'd see right about that level there, uh, a big white matter structure that's going from one side of the brain to the other. Now the two sides of the brain that we're talking about here, the two sides of the cerebrum, are called the right and left hemispheres. 
the only way they communicate back and forth with each other is through this big white matter structure called the corpus callosum. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you a video in a second that uh, shows you a person that's had a, a medical procedure done to cut the corpus callosum. Now, the reason this is done is because uh, he had really bad epilepsy. Now, epilepsy is essentially random electrical activity in the brain. So, let's say right here in his brain, some neurons started firing action potentials at random. And they're going to send those action potentials to whatever ner uh, neurons they're connected to, and so the activity will spread. spread. The connected neurons getting action potentials be activated and they'll make off their own action potentials and that'll spread further and further. So electrical activity just spreads randomly throughout the brain. For people with a really bad epilepsy, this can be really problematic. They can have seizures on a regular basis that'll just interfere with their ability uh, to live a normal life. They won't be able to hold down a job very successfully uh, because they never know if something's going to happen. They could be you know, in the middle of doing their job, then suddenly their brain decides that it doesn't want to work correctly and their body just stops working uh, for a little while. So it's really debilitating. For really, really bad epilepsy that spreads across both hemispheres, um, a procedure can be done where a knife cuts the corpus callosum. So any activity that's originating here can't spread across to the other side. It's stopped at the corpus callosum. And that also limits the spread a little bit better because some of what's causing it to spread throughout the whole brain is information going from one side to the other and back and forth. So if it's limited here, it might only spread a little bit. And it's going to really make that person's um, quality of life improve. Sorry? So I'm going to show you a video to answer that question precisely. Okay. Now the video I'm going to show you I have in the video content section in uh, Blackboard if you'd like to watch it yourself. Um, if I haven't said this before, I just have a bunch of videos that are relevant to the course. Um, and they're laid out in the order of the topics that we've covered. So it started off with some introductory stuff, and this is chemicals, um, membranes and cells, tissues. Et cetera, et cetera, skin, skeleton, bone growth, joints. Um, and then this is the start of the nervous system. Uh, for some reason, I don't have any muscle system videos in here. Um, and then uh, this is the video I want to show you. If you want to watch any of these videos, you can play them directly here in uh, the page. They're embedded. But you don't have control over them enough to like enlarge the picture. If you want to look at them full screen or something like that, you need to go to YouTube where they're found. I have a question. Yes. Um, the incision is made onto, onto the, um, uh, onto All of those questions the are going to be answered by this video. Okay. Um, so if you want to watch one of these in YouTube where it originally came from, you can either click on the title here or the YouTube over here. Um, if in any situation you're looking at videos, say in a makeup assignment, and the video is not playing correctly, the title down below here, um, if you highlight that and search for it on YouTube, uh, you'll get the, a link to the YouTube thing there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but if you have the video uh, available and you want to just go to it, just click on the title and it takes you to this. And you can enlarge it and look at the whole thing. So uh, this is just a show that was on PBS at one time. It's hosted by Alan Alda. We will see in a second. We began our journey into the human brain here on the campus of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I come to meet one of the world's leading brain scientists, Mike Pizantica, and a man he's worked with for over a decade. A man with two brains. You've been working a long time. Is that what he's having? 14 or 15 years? It doesn't seem like that. <laughs> the collaboration began when Joe had surgery. And you had this procedure to uh, uh, to correct an, an epileptic problem? Yeah, that's right. Trying to stop seizures. I was having seizures. 
like every day, it's always on. I still agree to that. To control Joe's epileptic seizures, the surgeon severed the connection between the two halves of his brain. Cutting the corpus callosum like this prevented the spread of the electric storms that caused the seizures. But it also prevented the left and right halves of his brain from communicating with each other. In the years since the operation, Joe's epilepsy has been under control. He now earns a living at an egg farm, and in his everyday life, he's largely unaffected by the fact that his left and his right brains work independently. Do you feel any different when you think about something that you did any differently from what you felt before the, the procedure? So I've got a backup brain. Right? No. <laughs> That's something everybody could use. <laughs> I found out how true that was right away when I was asked to draw a different shape with each hand. In a brain like mine, roughly speaking normal, at least all in one piece, the left half of my brain controls the right side of my body, while the right brain controls the left side. Oh, no. But because the two halves are connected, there's nothing wrong with that. Getting each hand to work independently isn't easy. Well, we're saying that the fact that uh, <laughs> That Alan's hemispheres are connected, yeah. and the uh, motor messages from one are confusing the motor messages of the other. I was just drawing an upside down duck. <laughs> okay. But when Joe is given the same task, his two hands operate as if controlled by two separate brains. What's happening is that each half of Joe's brain is given a separate instruction. He's asked to fix his eyes on the cross in the center of the screen. Anything flashing to the right of the cross goes only to his left hemisphere. Things to the left go to his right hemisphere. Because the two don't communicate, each hand does only what its half of the brain sees. Wow. <laughs> it's really like two different people doing the same. That's right. Same that's, right. that's the idea. Okay, Joe, uh, I want you to keep your hands up. In an experiment that's now a classic in brain research, Mike Azaniga, over 30 years ago, used a similar setup to find out if the two halves of the brain are specialized to do different things. Sure. Joe is being flashed a word only to one half of his brain. Words flashed to the right Store. are seen only by his left brain. And Joe can report seeing those words just fine. Yeah. Good. But when a word is flashed to his right brain, you can see that. Okay. So I'm going to ask, but now watch what happens. After all that, I would do that, Tim. I get lost. Why don't you try drawing another picture of it over here? Tell off, yeah. Almost as though somebody has given him a secret communication. That's right. Now he knows that that is a telephone up until when he was blind. Exactly. When Gazaniga first did this experiment, it instantly proved that the ability to speak resides almost exclusively in the left hemisphere. Not until he sees what his right brain is drawing is Joe able to name it. He said, Church now. After looking at it, okay. But he had to figure out about as long as we did. That's really interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a picture here of somebody communicating almost with another person. Communication is not occurring inside the head, it's occurring out on the piece of paper. Yeah. Wow. 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 So far, Joe has been seeing only one word. Yeah. Things That's get even stranger when he slashed two words, each to only one half of his brain. The right hemisphere is not totally. Yeah. And so his left hand draws a toad. So there's a toad. Oh, it's a toad. Right. And this time I was able to guess what was coming. Now put a little three-legged stool in there. Let me go on. Joe's speaking left brain saw a stool saying the word lets the hand that's controlled by his right brain in on the secret. That's great. That's really interesting. And if he had seen that with when the corpus callosum intact, he would have drawn a toad stool. Right. Okay, so um, 
that's the video. There's actually a second part if you're interested in watching more of it. Uh, but um, that demonstrates how uh, the two halves of the brain kind of work independently in a person that's had the corpus callosum split. Um, now, uh, that brings us up kind of to the point where we take a break. So let's take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about what we saw in this video, and then we'll go on from there. So it's uh, 2.55 right now, um, about 20 minutes, so quarter after, let's come back and keep going.